We can really only gauge the importance of an event after it happens. Something that may seem inconsequential at the time can turn out to have unexpected ramifications later on. That's what studying history is all about. Looking back, we can clearly see turning points, although people at the time may have had no idea where things are headed. And some turning points are so pivotal, they change world history for centuries to come. Consider the history of human languages. We know there are over 7,000 of them, yet only a tiny fraction are ever used by people on a global scale. Why is that? Well, some languages, like Chinese or Hindi, have become very large through the sheer size of their populations. Other languages, like Spanish, French, or English, have become global languages through conquest and colonialism. Ever since Columbus's voyage in 1492, Spanish has been on a path to become a world language. But there was a time, not so long before Columbus, that Castilian was just one dialect in a sparsely populated land. So what was the turning point that made it one of the world's most spoken languages today? Let's find out. Spanish began as a dialect of Latin, the language of the Roman Empire, which ruled the Mediterranean 2,000 years ago. When the empire collapsed, Latin evolved into many different dialects, becoming French, Italian, Portuguese, Catalan, Romanian, and other Romance languages. In the Iberian Peninsula, modern-day Spain and Portugal, numerous languages evolved. These included Galician and Leonese in the north, Catalan and Aragonese in the east, and Castilian in the central kingdoms of Castile and Leon. Eventually, Castilian became the dominant language of Spain and would be carried around the world with the expanding Spanish Empire. Our search for the beginning of Castilian's spread, Spanish's turning point, you might say, takes us back not just to 1492, but almost a thousand years before that, because on the other side of the Mediterranean, a major new religion was spreading, another turning point in history that would affect the growth of Spanish. In the 7th century, Islam emerged on the Arabian Peninsula. It spread teachings about God and biblical prophets through the Arabic holy book, the Quran. Islam spread quickly from Arabia, forming a vast united culture that spanned from India to the Iberian Peninsula. With its capital in Baghdad, it held some of the world's most important knowledge in the 9th and 10th centuries. Islamic scholars translated books from Persian and Classical Greek into Arabic, advancing learning in many fields from biology to medicine to astronomy and beyond. And that knowledge found its way to Spain with the spread of Muslim civilizations. After 711, Iberia was mostly a Muslim land, and its great cities were all Muslim cities. Learning took place in Arabic, which became the most prestigious and important intellectual language all around the Mediterranean Sea. It's a big building. That's because it's the Royal Palace. It's one of the largest palaces in Europe, and one of the most iconic buildings in the city of Madrid. Although it was built in the 18th century, it conceals a hidden Muslim past. A thousand years ago, on this site, there stood an Islamic fortress. So what happened? How did we get from a land dominated by Arabic to an empire that spread Spanish around the globe? As I looked for explanations of how Muslim Iberia was transformed into the Spain of today, I suspected that one important clue was the success of the Castilian language. To find out, I headed to the Spanish National Library, the Biblioteca Nacional. Behind me stands the largest collection of books in the Spanish language. The Biblioteca Nacional, or National Library of Madrid, receives every book printed in Spain and houses over 30 million items. It's thus a fitting place for statues that honor some of the most important figures 
in Spanish literature, like Lope de Vega, the contemporary of Shakespeare who penned thousands of classical plays, or Antonio de Nebrija who wrote the first grammar of the Castilian language, or Miguel de Cervantes who penned the immortal novel Don Quixote. But among these giants of Spanish writing, there's one figure who lived centuries before the others, a medieval king named Alfonso X, nicknamed El Sabio, the Wise, because of his great learning. Alfonso's name and his many accomplishments are little known outside of Spanish schoolbooks. To find out more about who this mysterious king was, I went to visit historian Mercedes Garcia Arenal. Alfonso X was the first king who had his whole court and administration work and write in Castilian, in a Romance language. No king in Europe was going to do that still for centuries. He's a very important king, Alfonso X. Inside the National Library, I was able to examine some of Alfonso's own original works. I realized that Alfonso was the bridge between Spain's Muslim past and its global present. To dig deeper into Alfonso's story, I would have to start in his birthplace, the city of Toledo. From the 8th to the 13th centuries, the Iberian Peninsula was dominated by Muslim civilization, which called the land Al-Andalus. Over the course of five centuries, the Christians conquered this territory, driving the Muslims south. Toledo's in the center of the peninsula, and when it was conquered in the year 1085, Christians left much of what they found intact. Instead of burning the books, they started reading them. But in Toledo, the Christians found some of the world's most important books still intact. All of the classics of ancient Greece, which were unknown in Latin, but preserved in the Muslim world. Philosophy books by Plato and Aristotle and their followers. Astronomical books by Ptolemy, medical books by Galen and Hippocrates, and many more. These books were rediscovered along with commentaries by great Muslim thinkers like Avicenna and Averroes. I visited the university's research center called the School of Translators. There, scholars are studying the history of translation in the city. El concepto de escuela de, de traductores de Toledo es, es un concepto moderno creado por los historiadores en el siglo XIX Eh, para referirse al, al movimiento de traducción que hubo en esta ciudad en la Edad Media. En esta ciudad convivían las tres culturas, eh, había población que dominaba tres, cuatro idiomas, y esto favorecía, era un caldo de cultivo perfecto para que aquí se desarrollara un movimiento de, de traducción. Aparte de que a esta ciudad llegaron una gran cantidad de bibliotecas, eh, sobre todo, eh, El, la Biblioteca de Córdoba, eh, muchos de sus libros eh, fueron trasladados hacia el norte uh -huh. y llegaron a la taifa de Toledo. Y más adelante, eh, pues sobre todo con el impulso de Alfonso X, pues, eh, es la, la corona la que retoma la actividad traductora e impulsa la traducción ahora ya hacia otra lengua, hacia el, hacia el castellano como lengua naciente, y todo el movimiento de, de traducción que hubo en esta ciudad favoreció y consolidó el, el desarrollo del castellano como, como idioma. So the year is 1221. When Alfonso was born in this city, Toledo, it was already a place famous for translation from Arabic. But just south of here was a land of war between Christians and Muslims. Over the next 30 years, Alfonso's father, Fernando III, would conquer most of it, reducing Muslim land by 75%. And when Alfonso took over in 1252, his kingdom was the largest and most powerful in the whole peninsula. So what was Alfonso going to do with his newfound power? You've got to understand the psychology of this young king. Fernando III was a larger-than-life military hero, and Alfonso wanted to live up to his father's greatness somehow. So he dedicated his crown's vast new resources to reviving a tradition that Toledo was famous for, translation. But Alfonso didn't want to just redo what had been done. 
He wanted to be original, so he chose to do something radical, to ignore Latin and instead to translate Arabic books into his own language, Castilian, which had not been used for science or learning. It may not be as dramatic as being a military hero, but his actions would change history for centuries and affect us, even into the modern day. Alfonso commissioned Jewish, Christian, and Muslim translators and intellectuals in his court to make Castilian versions of books from the Muslim world. These included literary fables, religious legends, medieval magic books, and above all, astronomy and astrology. In just a few decades, Alfonso elevated Castilian to be the most influential language in the Iberian Peninsula. To understand how important Alfonso's Castilian translations were, I went to see some of the original manuscripts made in his own workshops. I'm standing outside of El Escorial, the enormous palace and monastery built by Philip II in the 16th century, just outside of Madrid. Here we can find one of the largest collections in the world of Alfonso's original works. I'm inside the Escorial Library, and here we can see that Alfonso didn't just use the Castilian language to translate books out of Arabic. He also commissioned astronomers in his own court to take detailed measurements of the stars in order to expand the books of astronomy by thinkers in Baghdad and Toledo. His translations into Castilian would have an influence on science for centuries. His Libro del Saber de Astronomía, Book of Astronomical Knowledge, provided extensive information on how to use scientific tools like the astrolabe, the compass, and the water clock. Alfonso's astronomical tables, the Tablas Alfonsíes, built on these Arabic models and became widely known. European astronomers used these tables for over 300 years. Nicholas Copernicus, who revolutionized planetary science in the 16th century, had his own copy of Alfonso's tables. Alfonso also had his court scholars write numerous influential books in other areas. His History of Spain, or Historia de España, and General History, General Historia, include chronicles of Spain and the wider world. His Seven Parts, or Siete Partidas, is an exhaustive law code in the vernacular language. It was so influential in the development of modern law that Alfonso's image now hangs in the U.S. House of Representatives in Washington as one of the great lawgivers of history. Alfonso even wrote a book on games, describing chess, checkers, and dice games like backgammon. Alfonso's ambitious efforts transformed Castilian into a language of history, science, and law, setting it on a path to become a world language. Although the manuscripts he compiled are kept here in El Escorial, and his birthplace is Toledo, to truly understand Alfonso's role as the founder of the Spanish language, we have to continue our journey to the southern city of Seville. Fernando's conquest of Seville in 1248 was considered his greatest military victory. It was the most significant conquest since the Christian taking of Toledo. And it was so meaningful to the cause of Christian expansion that Fernando would later be made a saint by the Catholic Church. Seville was probably Alfonso's favorite city because it captured the beauty and style that he admired most, that of the Muslims who held this city only four years before he began his reign. The memory of Alfonso's father, Fernando, lives on in this city. That's him, on his horse, right here in front of City Hall, celebrating his military victory. And as you walk around the city, you'll discover that Seville remembers Alfonso too. The official motto of the city is attributed by popular legend to Alfonso himself. It says, Nodo, which stands for no me ha dejado, or it did not abandon me. 
These words can be found on every street in Seville, which still honors him for his great accomplishments. When Alfonso took over as king in 1252, the city had been one of the most important cities of Muslim al-Andalus just a few years before. One of the first things to happen after the conquest of the city was to rededicate the mosque as a church. And the mosque of Seville was one of the largest in al-Andalus or anywhere in the Mediterranean. It is recorded that Alfonso threatened to punish anyone who tried to tear the mosque down, both Christians who wanted to celebrate their victory and Muslims who didn't want the mosque to fall into Christian hands. The mosque's original courtyard and tower, or minaret, still stand today. The minaret now serves as a bell tower and is known as La Giralda, or the Spinning Lady, because of the weather vane on top of its pinnacle. Alfonso modeled his kingdom on that of the Muslim civilization his father conquered. Right next to the cathedral, he converted the existing Muslim fortress, or Alcazar, into a palace for his own uses. Today, it's the oldest royal residence in Spain, still used by the royal family during their state visits to the city. Alfonso preserved these monuments to display his new wealth. But he also continued to use Islamic style in the new structures he built. This hybrid approach of using Islamic style on Christian buildings is called Mudejar style, which refers to the Muslims who stayed behind after Alfonso took over as Castilian king. In making these combined styles, Alfonso established a pattern that would be carried on by later Castilian kings. I went to speak with historian Sebastián Fernández Aguilera about Alfonso's great-great-grandson, Pedro I. He expanded the Alcázar Palace in the 14th century. He explained how the entryway to Pedro's palace bears a unique inscription, praising the king in Castilian while also quoting Arabic. It says, There is no victor except God. Wala ghali Allah. The same words that appear in the Alhambra fortress, built in Muslim Granada. But on Pedro's palace, the inscription forms an intricate puzzle repeating the words eight times, forwards, backwards, and upside down. Because of Alfonso, we can read the history of the Spanish language in monuments like these, where Castilian and Arabic appear side by side. Remember those books Alfonso had translated? It was here in Seville that his translations of astronomical knowledge and star positions started to pay off by helping early modern navigators explore the seas. Ever since Roman soldiers first established a colony here in 206 BC during the Second Punic Wars, Seville's fortune has been tied to the river that runs through it, the Guadalquivir. During Alfonso's reign, the city was guarded by a lookout on the river known as the Golden Tower, or Torre del Oro. It was erected by the Muslims at the same time as the mosque. Near the tower, Alfonso built shipyards called the Atarasanas to defend the city and advance sea travel. Quien domine Sevilla controla la costa. That is, whoever holds Seville controls the coast. It's no accident that after Columbus's voyage to the Americas in 1492, Seville became the center of Spain's expanding maritime empire spanning east through the Mediterranean and west to the Americas and beyond, even to the Philippines. It was here, in the House of Trade, built inside the Alcazar, that Magellan first planned the circumnavigation of the globe in the early 16th century. That Amerigo Vespucci planned his voyage to the land that would take his name, America. After the conquest of the New World, Seville became the center of all government and trade relating to the Americas. Spanish explorers sent all documents from Spanish rule to Seville. These included everything from Columbus's letters to ledgers of the governments in Mexico and Peru. 
and they're still housed here today in the former counting house, the archive of the Indies. And they didn't just bring documents, they brought spices and slaves and silver, lots of silver. All of the wealth of the Americas, extracted by forced indigenous labor, passed through Seville, and the city grew rich on it. It produced opulent art and made towering monuments, and the city's dozens of convents and monasteries are decorated with it. Here in Seville, Christian, Muslim, and Jewish worlds combined on a path that collided, often violently, with the New World of the Americas. The former mosque turned church was torn down in the 15th century to make room for this towering Gothic cathedral, now the largest Gothic cathedral in the world. Today, most visitors stop at this tomb, that of Christopher Columbus. Yet they don't know that the tombs of Alfonso and his father are only a few steps away in the royal chapel. Alfonso built a tomb to honor his father, Fernando, and it is covered in inscriptions praising him as the conqueror of Seville. Appropriately, these inscriptions are written in the four languages of his kingdom, Latin, Hebrew, Arabic, and Castilian. So what were we looking for? Turning points. Because of Alfonso's translations, Castilian became a dominant language. Because of Seville's location and Spain's imperial ambitions, that language spread around the world. Today, it's spoken by hundreds of millions of people on every continent. Gracias. And yet, who remembers Alfonso's name today? Remember I mentioned how the official motto of the city of Seville is attributed by popular legend to Alfonso himself. It's everywhere we look, from flags to signs to manhole covers. Alfonso's words give thanks to the city, because as he said, no me ha dejado, it did not abandon me. And Alfonso's words remind us that turning points in history are evident everywhere we look. We just have to remember to look for them.